This episode of The Modern Rogue brought to you by our friends over at World of Tanks. Click on the link below, use promo code TANKTASTIC when you sign in, and you will get a bunch of loot. You can start repping the Rogue Empire as you do battle. What's the most insane strategy you've ever tried that has worked? Nobody messes with you when you poop your pants. Sorry? Nobody wants to mess with you. I mean, I agree with the thesis, but where does this go? The key is you don't break eye contact. <laughs> oh my god, you did not do this. Please, I don't, I don't want to believe this, but I kind of believe it. Look at me, Brian. No. Look no, at me. Look at you. Dude, we have hundreds of articles over at ModernRogue.com. This one's written by Christian Markle and Karen Jones. It's five comically insane war tactics that actually worked. Oh, I love this. Okay, so the first one is uh, in the seventh century in China, a uh, general by the name of Chai Shao. The, yeah, there's no way we're gonna say this right. Chai Shao, Chai, Ch General Ch Chai Shao. Chai Shao, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Everything was fine until the dancing nation attacked. Yeah, so he was at a locational disadvantage. Is that code for the bottom of a hill? <laughs> a uh, locational? It's, a, it's, a, it's not like you're giving a press briefing during Vietnam. Have you not seen Revenge of the Sith, Brian? <laughs> yeah. Come on. The That's high right. ground is important. <laughs> yes. Everyone from Sun Tzu to Obi-Wan knows that. <laughs> the more important part is it's harder to climb up to the high ground if they're raining arrows down on yeah, you. Yeah, especially when you got the game changer of a bunch of archers. And so they were going up against these two who invaders with their uh, with their bows and arrows. This is a strategy straight out of like Avatar The Last Airbender. I don't know that that's right at all. No, I'm watching it right now. I can see Sokka doing this. No. like Because he wanted to be a Kyoshi. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. Okay, anyway. So it was not unusual for them to have women in the encampments. And so General Chai Shao said, all the ladies in the house, go up the hill, pretend to be a dance troupe with this musician and dance for these Tuhuyan invaders. Apparently it was a very sexy dance because it got everybody distracted and then the cavalry was able to surround them, come in and slaughter everybody. And as they point out in the article, this is exactly the Uhura Gambit from Star Trek V. And I watched the clip again, it is exactly what happens. <laughs> well, I guess by default it has to be number one now. <laughs> the Uhura Gambit. This lunatic just literally set birds on fire. All right, let's go to 11th century Norway. Harald Sigurdsson is known as a hard ruler, which is a name you get for being a hard ruler. Also a deceptive, conniving, and incredible tactician. He would do stuff like he faked his own death and then sent his own casket with a retinue of people into his enemy's encampment saying, he's dead. Can we just bury him on this land? And they're like, that's cool. And then he pops out. I love that. I love that. Ha ha! I am the Dread Pirate Roberts! Yes. <laughs> but specifically, we're talking about the tactic of he's trying to take a city and he can't get in. The walls are too big, too well defended or whatever. But he's just like, looks like those birds don't have any trouble getting in and out. And so he directs his army to capture as many birds as they can because obviously they have nests in the city. They're just going out to get bugs. And then he takes takes all the birds. Now it says wood chips in the article. I would have to imagine maybe maybe some uh, uh, something a little bit fluffier that'll uh, keep a flame alive. Sure. But basically they all light the wood on fire that's attached to the birds. They all go back to their nests which are perfect little tinder boxes setting the entire city on fire from inside. I believe this one. I know you were questioning I mean, it a little still, bit. I absolutely believe some version of this. I, I don't know. It, it, that's what, it's just so, just so. You know, in World War II, they experimented with uh, putting uh, explosive payloads on bats and releasing them into cities. That is the coolest sentence I have heard in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so fine. So, so how do we rank these? You know, I like this one, not so keen on the animal abuse. Birds are not. Oh, get out of here. It's uh, war. I, I, I know. I'm more worried about the human abuse and the, I, and the, and the human rights abuse. I'm not. Humans are shit. Uh, you know what? Just for that, I'm putting this at number one. <laughs> <laughs> Said sexy women. I'm all, I want firebirds. I'm still with the Uhura Gambit, man. No, no. Now I believe, the, now I believe in the firebirds. The British underestimate Japanese wartime BMX crews. So when the Commonwealth of Singapore was ruled by the British in World War II, and they thought, oh, we're gonna be fine. We've got a lot of rough terrain around here. There's no way that the Japanese can get to us. That's right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they're all the way, they're an island and we have a country between us, yeah. it'll be fine. And they can't build bridges, they can't get through the jungle and everything. 
What did the Japanese do? They rode bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I like to think that they, they got their tights they, on. No, they went over to REI. They got some water bottles yeah. and stuff. They, they put the gel in their undercarriage area to prevent from chafing. You know, the, the important part is that bikes have so many tactical advantages because if you need to cross rough terrain, I mean, obviously there's going to be you know it's going to be a bumpy ride, but you don't have to build a bridge wide enough or strong enough to support a tank or a car or anything. You just need some you know to, what what like this much uh, some bamboo, put it across a a river and you just ride your bike on over. Or do some sweet jumps. <laughs> and apparently long after the, the tires would explode or whatever, they just, they just kept riding on the rims because it still works. Which gave them a psychological advantage because when you're riding on the rims through the town, it sounded like a bunch of tanks. <laughs> the Battle of Singapore ended when 60,000 British soldiers surrendered in what is thought to be by some the worst defeat in British history. I like to imagine that the Japanese came in like the 80s classic rad and they're on a BMX, <laughs> you know, and they're just doing tricks and like popping wheelies and everything. What's funny is I just had the thought, I wish I knew more about Rad, and then the other part of my brain thought, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Viewing party. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say this one makes total sense. There's not really much of a twist here. I'm gonna place it above Uhura, but below Firebirds. No, no, disagree. I'm gonna say that Uhura, still number one, Bicycles, number three. Firebirds is at number two. All right. The Pigeon Man became a war criminal. Also at World War II. Turns out, sending stuff by pigeons never went out of style. Yeah, they uh, would strap messages to pigeons and toss them out of planes. The interesting thing here to me is that they got Maiden Form, the premier manufacturer of women's underwear, to say, hey, could you make it smaller? <laughs> could, could you do less bras and more Pigeon parachutes. Pigeon diapers <laughs> for messages. I think there was almost 900 birds that were used and 95% of them found their way home. How insane is that? Yeah, apparently, and I don't know if this is true, it's apocryphal that pigeons have infinite attention spans. Oh, dude, that's, sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so where did we put this in our lineups? Uh, the pigeon one? Yeah. Ah, it's, it's not terribly crazy or exotic, so I'm gonna keep it at the bottom. It's at the bottom for me too, because yeah. my guess is they're taking basically a super old method that was used in wars for, you know, centuries before, and the only thing that's novel about it is that they were still using it during World War II. Yeah. Sorry, pigeons. Sun Tzu's The Art of Sick Days. Number five, still in World War II. Now we're talking about, uh, it's either Denis or Dennis, I don't know, uh, uh, Delmer, who is uh, Austra born in Germany to Australian parents and one of the greatest propagandists in the war. Oh, I do love wartime propaganda and psych ops. It's uh, something I'm very fascinated in. This guy, was, as described in the article, just a pain in Germany's ass. Yeah, so one of the things he did is he would have broadcasts where he would have people complaining about how demoralized they are. They, they would have easily verifiable true facts mixed in with believable fake facts, all of which portrayed a story to anybody who is intercepting broadcasts of, man, it sucks being Germany, bro. We're totally losing the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he would seed it with a little bit of truth so it was easy to really get everything confused. He he also faked a bunch of food stamps. He would produce superior ones, but then also produce inferior ones, so no one was really sure which was the right one. And basically the purpose of that, I assume, is to flood the market with too many food stamps and destabilize their economy from within, so you have haves and have-nots and there's just not enough food to go around. Yeah, you're just totally screwing with their infrastructure. Uh, one of the other things he did that I loved was he told people how to Ferris Bueller the German army. Yeah. It's like, listen, how, here's how you fake sick. You don't want to fight? Here's how you get away with it. Step one, lick your palms and <laughs> clammy hands. <laughs> yes. Don't fake a fever, because you might have to go to the doctor and that's worse than going to war. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, so he would leave these books around, you know, at coffee shops or whatever, and people would thumb through, and it's like, maybe you love Germany, but I mean, not enough to die for. And then <laughs> yeah. it, and it did two things. First of all, it got people who didn't want to go to war to get out of the war. Second of all, those who did go to war and then actually got sick, 
Oh, they, you're faking. Exactly. Go back and make Get everybody back else there. sick. Yes, exactly. Had a major demoralizing effect. This one rockets straight to number one in my book. Oh, I think it's really clever, but it's still number two for me. Mm. Because Uhura and what I'm imagining <laughs> as a dance-off, an ancient Chinese <laughs> battlefield dance battle, which is really how all wars should be fought, yes, to be right, honest. you're right. Step up to ancient China edition. We'll call it the Dance Dance Resolution. Dance Dance. It's resolution. Hello, good place. That one is number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, that one's number one for me. Number two is uh, uh, Mr. Delmer, the uh, propagandist. And then the fire And then birds. the rest, yeah. Yeah, and then the rest. All right. If you guys dig this stuff, there's tons of articles over at Modern Rogue or themodernrogue.com. And also thank you patrons at patreon.com slash modernrogue. Champions, one and all. Guys, I'm so excited about this. I remember the first time our friends over at World of Tanks sponsored our show. We built a freaking tank. Feeling this? I'm ready. Engage. In the time. Oh, what, 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 what? <laughs> no, no, we're fine, we're fine. Uh, I mean, granted, it ran on potatoes and gasoline and wasn't a tank. Technically, I think it was a light armored vehicle improvised. But the point is, World of Tanks lets you have a massive battlefield. You get so many different tanks. You get all the action of doing battle. Da -da 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 -da. That's what battles sound like, I assume. I'm. They've got a huge tank arsenal and it's totally free to play, but the most important thing is if you click that link below, not only will you be supporting our show, you'll get a whole bunch of loot, including a T-127 tank, 500 gold, and seven days of premium access. By the way, you sneaky rogues, that's only for the new players. Don't try to double dip. The game's totally free to play and I want you guys representing us. We need a rogue army of tanks that runs on something better than potatoes. Thank you very much, world of tanks. Now I want french fries. Offer and link in the description below. Uh, uh, 60,000 British soldiers. 60,000 British soldiers. 60,000 British, British soldiers. Oh, that's a tongue twister. Let me make sure I got that right. Got it. The Battle of Singapore ended when 60,000 British soldiers.